No country has ever attacked every other country. And that's what China has done. Those are pretty powerful words, what you just said right there. Beijing has really worked very hard to prevent us from learning what's going on. What is the level of accountability to them that all the other countries can come out and say, listen, you cost us a lot of money. The Communist Party of China and the World Health Organization helped spread this coronavirus around the world. How could they not know about it? I mean, they're a World Health Organization. They've got doctors. What is the motive between World Health Organization protecting China? That's what I'm curious about. We need to get China out of the UN, out of the World Trade Organization, out of the World Health Organization, and just start to isolate it. We're relying on them on pharma. We're relying on them on a lot of different things. I mean, it's sickened hundreds of thousands of people around the world, and it is not done with us yet. That is not a conspiracy theory. This is horrific. 30 seconds. Did you ever think you would make it? Did you I feel I'm so close, I could take sweet victory I know this life meant for me yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Yeah. Value taming, giving values contagious This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to haters How they run, homie, look what I become I'm the, I'm the one So my guest today is Gordon Chang, the author of Coming Collapse of China, who lived nearly two decades in China. You've probably seen him all over TV on a recent interviews uh, regarding coronavirus. And the reason why I wanted to bring him on board to do this interview, many of you guys requested it. You've obviously known a lot of different guests that we've had, but he comes from a place of, he went to law school, Cornell University. He worked for two big law firms in China. I believe one is in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, and uh, he has a lot of different experience, so his perspective is going to be from a different standpoint, and he happens to be half Chinese. His father is from China, and uh, so I'm looking forward to going into it with him. So, Gordon, thank you so much for making the time to be a guest with us here on Oh, well, thank you so much, Patrick. So, so if I may get into it, this is, this is the approach I'd like to take with this uh, on this interview, and, uh, and the reason why I'm taking this approach is the following reason. My Instagram account, my messages, my email, ever since we inter interviewed General Spaulding uh, from the Air Force, which I think you, you two have worked together on a couple different projects, and uh, he knows of you. You were recently in a documentary together that came out a couple days ago, and he ended up getting 7 million views, and people contacted us all over the place. So then we brought on board uh, Daniel DiMartino uh, Booth yesterday. We talked about the effects of coronavirus to the economy and she it's just the amount of commentary and people's interest in it it's a whole different place but also at the same time a lot of interviews on youtube on vimeo all over social media have gone viral whether it's uh you know joe rogan did it with michael uh, osterhold or to david ike with uh, brian rose from london real that's gone all over the place and the video has been taken down from youtube from vimeo from a lot of different platforms or General Spaulding, or Dr. Shiva, or Fauci, or a lot of names. Obviously, people are curious. The direction I want to go with this is the following. I would like to bring up all of these different conspiracy theories that are coming up, and for you to say, nope, there's no truth behind that. Yes, there is some credibility behind that. So you can either tell us zero credibility behind it, maybe 50%, and that is not a conspiracy. That is an accurate statement. So if you don't mind us going through that direction, I think the viewers would like to see it from a person that's a lawyer, Cornell University, who's lived in China for two decades and has been over here. Maybe you're going to give us a different perspective. Are you okay with that? Terrific. Okay. So let's get right into it. So uh, first of all, is coronavirus real? Does it exist? Well, it certainly exists. I mean, it's sickened hundreds of thousands of people around the world, and it is not done with us yet. Um, we tend to think that because it is a coronavirus that it will disappear in the summer. Um, but we also know that this bug likes hot weather. So we're just going to have to wait and see because it is surprising us day by day. Okay. So yes, it is real. Number two, is it a natural virus that came from the you know wet market where it's not man-made, it's natural that kind of happened, or is it man-made, intentionally made to use as a bio-warfare chemical uh, to go against an enemy? Well, so far, the science says that it is a natural. 
um, that it is there. Um, it wasn't spliced. There have been a couple papers which have talked about it being um, engineered, um, but those papers have not received uh, general acceptance in the scientific community. The one thing, though, that's really important, Patrick, is that Beijing has, has done its best to hinder uh, foreign virologists and epidemiologists from going into Wuhan, the epicenter, and studying this. The World Health Organization sent a team into China. They were there for maybe about two weeks, but they were only in Wuhan for two days, February 20th and 21st. They only were able to send part of the team. And, and really, they did not have the opportunity to study the uh, virus itself. I think these were more or less sort of like get to know you meetings. So um, Beijing has really worked very hard to prevent us from learning what's going on. And because of that, of course, we got to say most everything is on the table, but we have been able to study this bug because it's gotten out beyond China's borders. And so far, it looks like it is a natural uh, coronavirus. It, it looks like it is a natural coronavirus or it's man-made? No, it is not man-made from most okay. of the science that we have seen so far. Not every scientist will agree with that conclusion, but you know, until somebody comes up with a striking discovery, um, the consensus is that this is not man-made. Okay, fair. So by the way, that's uh, interesting for you to say that because there's a lot of people that are saying it is man-made uh, and it is intentional. That leads me to the next question. How much of what is going on right now is due to a president like Donald Trump, whose his entire career has been based on the art of the deal to be able to negotiate and strong arm his opponent based on the kind of leverage he has. So he decided to go against the biggest opponent of U.S., which happens to be China. And he used every single leverage, knowing how much business China does with U.S., knowing how much import we do from there, relying on U.S. economy. So the more and more tariffs he put, China said, if this is the kind of a game you want to play, you know, China's always been a kind of a person that they don't fight like you head on. They typically fight by using whether it's proxies or, you know, oh, we didn't do it. Our hands weren't touching that. That's not on, uh, on us. How much of it has to do with them using coronavirus as a method to retaliate to Donald Trump's approach of negotiation? Yeah, I don't think that this is about Donald Trump at all. Um, there, there's a lot that we can say about the origin of the virus, and maybe we should circle back. Um, because a lot of people say, well, because this probably wasn't engineered, um, it was just sort of like naturally occurring. You know, it, it jumped to humans at that wet market in Wuhan. Well, maybe so, but there's a lot of science that says that it wasn't, Patrick. It didn't come from there because there are a number of initial patients who had no contact with that wet market. And although if you go back two weeks, people were saying, you know, the idea this came from um, a lab was um, conspiratorial. This could very well have been the release of a natural virus from one of those two labs that people have been talking about. One of those two labs near Wuhan um, is the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It's a P4 biosafety lab. That's the highest level of safety. China um, has told us that they stored 1,500 varieties of coronavirus in that lab. And so a lot of people are saying, well, this is an accidental release. Um, this gets to a number of, of different points that eventually I will answer your question. But look at what happened. This has been you know, a, a bug which has ravaged China. And China's leaders have known that. What they have done, though, is really striking. So for instance, they knew about this in Beijing sometime maybe first week of December, probably in November. In November, the second week of December, maybe the third week, leaders in Beijing knew that this could be um, transmitted from one human to the next. Because doctors in Wuhan knew that by at least the second week of December. But China's leaders didn't actually uh, admit this to the world until January 20th. And that is, that's, there's a time gap there. Now, just sort of sitting on that information would have been highly irresponsible, but it's much worse than that. What they did was in that interim, where they knew that this was contagious, one person to the next, they actually tried to convince the world that it was not human to human transmissible. 
And we saw this, for instance, in that January 14th tweet from the World Health Organization, which said, you know, based on information from China, we see no clear proof that this is transmitted from one human to the next. The reason why that's important is because Beijing actually tried to lull the world into a sense of false sense of security. And at the same time, Patrick, Beijing um, was really working very hard to prevent countries from imposing travel restrictions on China. The way this bug got out of China was people, people who traveled. Beijing did two things during a critical period. It, it tried to deceive the world about how this was transmitted, and it made sure that countries did not prevent people arriving from China. Now, I don't know what was in the mind of Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, but he saw clearly what the coronavirus did to his own country. It crippled China. So if he actually wanted to cripple other countries, he in fact would have done exactly what he did. So we have to be concerned that this has nothing to do with Trump. I think that it's because Xi Jinping realized how bad things were in China. He wanted to level the playing field, the geopolitical playing field. So he allowed this virus, he actually deliberately took steps to push this virus outside of China to infect and hobble other societies. That has nothing to do with Donald Trump. This was Xi Jinping taking a bad situation and trying to turn it to China's advantage. Th those are pretty powerful words, what you just said right there, Gordon. You just said intentional. So this yes. was not accidental. This was intentional done by them. This was an intentional spread of the virus beyond China. Now, how I certain, think that how the, certain are you of that? I don't mean to interrupt, but when you say that, what level of certainty do you have in that statement? It's just an issue of analysis that when you look at what they in fact did, there is no other explanation for it other than um, that they intentionally wanted this to spread beyond China. Because this is, this is not just a question of keeping it secret because they were embarrassed. That would have been bad enough. That would have been highly irresponsible. But when they then tried to tell other countries, oh, don't worry about this. This can't be transmitted human to human. What it did was it actually took other public health officials in other countries that did not take those precautions that they otherwise would have adopted. And we also know something similar happened with their infection and death statistics. Uh, we heard um, the White House Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks, talk about how they looked at the statistics from China in terms of new cases and deaths. And they said, oh, this is like SARS, which was the 2002-2003 epidemic, which although it had a high mortality rate, was not very contagious. So basically what Beijing, uh, so what, what the White House did was essentially say, oh, okay, we don't have to take certain precautions. It was only after the US saw what happened in Italy and Spain that they realized that they had a far bigger problem on their hands, that this would become not just an epidemic in China, but a global pandemic. It would affect the US. And that's why the, I think the White House took precautions much later than it otherwise would have. So you put all that stuff together, and the question is, well, why would Beijing do this? I can't think of another explanation other than that they saw that they had an opportunity to cripple other societies. I'm not saying that this is a bioweapon. I don't think that it was. But what they saw after it, it hurt China was that they decided that they were going to spread it through the rest of the world. Gordon, before I go to the next uh, uh, conspiracy to ask you about, is if that is a factual statement of six weeks, how are they held accountable by the world tribunal? tribunal what, what is the level of accountability to them that all the other countries can come out and say, listen, you cost us a lot of money. Is there any way of uh, holding them responsible for waiting six weeks? Well, there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, there are some cases in U.S. federal district courts in Florida, Texas, and Nevada. I don't think they're going to get anywhere because there's something called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. You just can't go out and sue another country in U.S. federal court. 
unless you can get around some exceptions, unless you can take advantage of some exceptions. Mm -hmm. There's also the International Court of Justice, but that won't work because China has to agree to jurisdiction, and of course it never would do so. But countries are, are um, in possession uh, effectively of, of assets of China. For instance, um, China's holding more than a trillion dollars worth of U.S. Treasury bills and, and notes. Um, so we can take those just with the flick of a pen, um, and other countries can do the same thing. So there's a lot there that can be done. Um, and I'm not saying that the U.S. should do this by itself. I don't think we should, because China would say that that was a repudiation of debt. They would slam us for being um, irresponsible custodians of the global financial system. But they would be able to say that if we took this action in conjunction with the issuers of other major currencies. So for instance, Ottawa, London, Brussels, Tokyo, if we did that in connection with them, then that's somewhat of an effective uh, measure. Now, we can't confiscate enough of China's assets to compensate us um, for the economic damage that we've suffered. Um, but nonetheless, we need to do something to deter China and other bad actors from doing something like this again. You know, we'll never get compensated for this. We've lost lives. You can't do anything about that. Even with the economic damage, um, you know, China doesn't have enough um, in terms of assets, but we de do need to deter China. And, and one other thing, Patrick, and that is that uh, what China's leaders did is a crime against humanity. Um, if, if it isn't, then there is no such concept. And there is no such thing. So um, I think countries need to hold Xi Jinping and other senior Chinese leaders responsible. And if we can ever get our hands on them, we need the 21st century version of the Nuremberg trials. And what does that look like? What could that look like? That could look like what we saw with German leaders, with, with Japanese leaders after the Second World War. And no one, of course, wants to do this, but we've never seen a crime like this in history. No country has ever attacked every other country. And that's what China has done. Um, it's hard for us to grasp the... Um, the magnitude of what's occurred. But um, unfortunately, that's the conclusion that we have to face. And, um, you know, going forward for our children, forget ourselves, but for our children and for the rest of the world, um, we need to impose a cost on China so that no regime ever does this again. There's a big difference between Germany and uh, Japan versus China because neither Germany nor Japan had 17% of world GDP at the time when we did that. You're talking about, uh, you know what this almost reminds me of when you're going there? It almost re reminds me of the whole too big to fail type of situation because on one end, if you do anything to them, how many economies are tied to China? where China definitely knows that because you know this is a game of leverage and they know their level of leverage because as much as we're talking about masks this and China this and China that, we're getting masks from them. We're relying on them on pharma. We're relying on them on a lot of different things. So do you think for them when they're sitting in the boardroom and nobody else is around, the big decision makers, they're saying, let it loose, relax for six weeks, let it get bigger, let's hurt some of these guys for them to really know how afraid they are and they're going to do nothing about it because they're relying on us on X y z and because of that if they even think about doing anything to us we're going to hurt them because they're going to make sure we have to stay in business to do what we're doing on a daily basis for the world to survive do you think they went that deep into processing this before they made their decision to let it be lax for six weeks possibly you know i, I don't know all, all i know is um there's no other explanation um for you know this other than a deliberate release how they got there you know i don't know but you know, Patrick, I think we have to worry a lot less than we normally would first at first glance think. Yes, we're, we're critically reliant on pharma and um, that we've got to reduce regardless of, of whatever. 80%, but when, that's a big number. It is a big number, but we can do it because they are not the world's only producer of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, and you know, it, it'll be hard, but eventually we've got to do this anyway. But the one thing that we always think about, we think, oh, China's the engine of global growth. And so therefore the world is reliant on it. That's not true. China is not an engine of global growth. Yes, they've got a lot of growth, but they're not the engine. 
Because to be an engine of global growth, a country has got to buy the goods and services of other countries to create growth elsewhere. And what China has done through predatory trade policies and through the theft of intellectual property has taken growth from other countries. So yes, countries have relations with, with China. Australia, for instance, sells them a lot of iron ore. But that iron ore is put into products that end up you know, in the shelves of Europe and the United States. So I, I think that essentially Australia will be selling to India or Vietnam or someplace else for sale to the US. These global supply chains, if they are forced, will readjust. Um, and they're already doing that anyway for a number of reasons. You know, Xi Jinping has been pushing companies out of China. Also, President Trump's so-called trade war has been pulling companies out of China. I think that that process will accelerate. Uh, because of the coronavirus epidemic, we are going to reduce our, our, our reliance on China as a producer of pharmaceuticals and uh, obviously medical protective equipment. So these things are going to happen anyway, but I think that they're certainly going to be accelerated and they should be accelerated. I don't think they're the engine. Obviously, I know U.S. is 100% the engine. There's no question about that. I'm 100% capitalist. I, we escaped Iran to go to Germany refugee camp to come here because this is the American dream. Nobody wakes up and says the Chinese dream. They say the American dream. It's only one kind of a dream. But uh, 1.6 billion is a lot of people, you know, and when you can produce things for nothing by a communistic government ran on a, you know, wink, wink, capitalistic economy controlled by national, I mean, so it concerns me to know 17% and it concerns me to know how many countries are relying on them, but that's fine. Let's continue. I'm sure we're going to come back to this topic again. Next conspiracy. Uh, the death toll, okay, the death toll. Uh, you're hearing some people talk about the fact that, look, 99% uh, uh, of people that died in Italy, the number one cause wasn't coronavirus. They were there for another case, and they had other health symptoms, which they had gone to the hospital before, but it happened to be that they also got coronavirus because maybe their immune system wasn't that strong, so they caught something. So then the hospital had to put it that the reason for the person dying was coronavirus and that spikes up the numbers and it scares the hell out of everybody around the world. How much credibility do you put on the topic of the fact that people who have died, they didn't all necessarily die due to coronavirus. It could have been other reasons. Yeah. I'm sure that in certain cases, coronavirus was only a contributing factor. You know, I'm also sure that a number of people who have died, you know, they weren't getting autopsies, especially in an emergency situation. They could have had coronavirus and are not counted as coronavirus cases. Got so, it. you know, counting sure. of cases in an epidemic where there's a medical emergency, you know, society on the verge of collapse, you know, statistical accuracy is probably not at the top of the list of priorities of a government in that case. And, you know, we know, for instance, in Wuhan, um, you know, that was authorities there were being overwhelmed. Um, so accurately counting um, uh, coronavirus cases, not, not important for them. They were, just not? Trying to, they were just trying to sweep up corpses on the streets and hospital floors. When you say they, are you talking Italy? Who, who, who is they? Oh, in, in China, um, in Wuhan, in the early days of the outbreak, um, the authorities were just completely overwhelmed. Got you it. had people literally dropping dead in the streets. You had corpses on hospital floors for more than 12 hours. So this was um, a system that was being overwhelmed. And the point I'm making is there were a couple of reasons why the statistics out of China, out of Wuhan, um, are not accurate. One of them is just that the authorities just did not have the capability to accurately count uh, victims. But also there was deliberate falsehood. And um, of those two cases, of those two reasons, Deliberate falsehood was certainly, I think, the more important in terms of distorting the uh, death toll and the it toll and, and the number of uh, infections. How much do you trust the data that we're getting from U.S. on cases to death toll? How much credibility do you give to that data? Well, you know, we're doing the best we can. Um, and as I mentioned, th there are a number of reasons why we won't ever get an exact, accurate toll. Um, as I mentioned, you don't do autopsies on, on people who have died. Um, so this is, this is a case of you know, testing and whatever. 
Our numbers, I'm sure, um, lag the real situation, but that's true in every country. I don't think that there is an attempt to underplay this, but we did see that, of course, in China because um, there are there's a lot of indi- a lot of evidence that shows that uh, indeed those death toll numbers could not have been true, could not be accurate. Okay. Okay, next conspiracy. Is there any uh, linkage between coronavirus and 5G? Yeah, you hear this this a little bit. I actually, uh, I mean, I'm not a scientist. I don't know, but I would be very surprised if there were, because I can't think of why um, there would be a linkage between the two. So my view is that that's a conspiracy theory. And unless someone comes up with proof, and I don't think that they will, um, we can just discard that one. Who would be the right person to talk to about that, by the way? That's not politically connected to an organization that's funded by the government or some big name that's funding it behind closed doors that the guy's not going to tell the truth. Who would be the right person to talk to about that? You know, I don't know. Um, I mean, you have to find basically someone who was an epidemiologist, a virologist, and also an expert in telecommunications. Um, and I don't think such people exist. And no. by the way, you'd have to find someone who wasn't working for a telecom company, who wasn't working for, exactly. you know, that, that person, you know, I'd love to have that person, but <laughs> no. That person would be very interesting to sit down with because we keep, you know, we, we, we want to sit down with people who are promoting the 5G side, but they're profiting from it. So would they really say anything bad about it? And then there are those that are working for a, nonprofit that's being funded by some of these bigger corporations that are selling 5G. So would they really say anything to the man that's cutting the check? I don't know. So, okay, let's go to the next topic. Fair enough. A lot of people are talking about 5G and coronavirus because of whole radiation and how it's eating up the process. Uh, uh, Next, is coronavirus uh, a, a method of eliminating the older population to save countries money because all this healthcare cost is really coming from those that are above 70, 75 years old, and maybe this is going to allow us to uh, uh, indirectly depopulate uh, uh, to uh, help the world economy go better. Is there any linkage between those two? No, um, but I will say that um, there are more than just a small number of people in China who actually think that this was a way to get rid of the elderly, but that's complete conspiracy theory. Um, I mean, it's just, there's, that's, that's just not the case. Okay, next. So far, we've got six of them. I got seven more to go. So, uh, okay, we already covered the seventh one. Let me go to the next one. Okay, next one's a little tricky. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's almost like the next four are combined. So I'll kind of say it in, uh, in a way that maybe you'll see where I'm going with this. So a couple, couple data that shows up. The World Health Organization, the number one funder is the U.S. government. I think the number is $600 million. I don't know the exact number, but I think it's around a $600 million number. The second largest contributor to the World Health Organization is a man named Bill Gates. Okay. So this man named Bill Gates, if you've never heard of him, he's very rich. He's very powerful. He started a company called Microsoft. Maybe you've used it in the past before, Windows, et cetera, et cetera. Bill Gates uh, in 2015 gave a TED talk uh, regarding the biggest threat being pandemics and how that's something we need to be worried about. But also in 2011, he did an interview with Dr. Gupta of CNN. I think it's February 4th when they did an interview. And a lot of people were talking about the fact that Bill Gates' biggest messaging is depopulation. So what I did is I went on Google, I typed in the words, did Bill Gates say to depopulate the world? So the first thing that pops out is Snopes. So I go to Snopes and I pull it up and it says inaccurate, false. Then it puts the transcript on the bottom, which I have it, I'd like to read it because this leads me to a question here. The the question asked by Dr. Gupta is $10 billion over the next 10 years to make it the year of the vaccine. What does this mean exactly? Bill Gates, over this decade, we believe unbelievable progress can be made in both inventing new vaccines and making sure that they get out to all the children who need them. We only need about six or seven more, and then you would have all the tools to reduce childhood death, next word he uses, reduce population growth and everything, the stability, the environment benefits from that, et cetera, et cetera. 
So then I went online to look at this video. I went and typed in the following words on Google and the words were, uh, uh, this is what I searched. I typed in, uh, uh, I want to get the exact words that I have here. Bill Gates, Dr. Gupta, reduced population 2011. Those were the words I put on Google. The first link that came at the top was the Snopes that said it's not factual, it's false. The second link that came up was a CNN link to the article and the interview of February 2011. When I clicked on it, the link was a dead link. Then I tried it on my phone, then I tried it on another phone, it was all a dead link. Then I had one of my employees here from Norway who uses a VPN from Norway to try to go log in from a Norway VPN. He was able to get into the site. When he gets into the site, his link with the transcript was there, but the video was taken down. You couldn't watch the video. So after our research team did some research, we finally found the video and that exact video between Dr. Gupta and Bill Gates where he talks about reducing population growth. You know, a big part of this, when you look at uh, uh, China buying a big part of Africa because of natural resources, this is not something that's private. The world knows about this. It's not like I'm just throwing a, 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 a something out there that's a, a non-factual. That's factual. You can kind of see the amount of property and land they're buying there. The countries that are growing the fastest population-wise, most of them are in Africa. Not saying all of them, but a lot of them are in Africa. 7.6% right. growth, uh, Syria, you know. 4.3%. In the U.S., I think it's at 1.38, some number, 1.08 to 1.38. And I think China's at 0.38 right now, give or take. Sometimes they're saying it's negative, but that's the number you're seeing. How much do you buy into the idea that Bill Gates and the vaccines and the pandemics, this was all orchestrated by the powerful people who are kind of preparing for this to come up to introduce a vaccine to the world? It's almost like Here's the problem, the Hegelian dialectic. This is the problem. Blame Johnny. I have the solution. I am the hero. How much of it is that, or do you think that's a conspiracy theory? Yeah, I don't, I don't think Bill Gates is trying to reduce population by, um, um, and I can't quite think of the word, but I, 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 I don't think that Bill Gates is, is out to kill people or whatever. Bill Gates probably believes that there should be fewer humans. Um, and he would like to improve human health, but that doesn't mean that you, he's trying to improve human health and vaccines to sort of reduce the overall number of people. Um, I mean, I, I would disagree with him on, on certain things, but I don't think he's malevolent. Okay, so zero credibility there on your end with that. Zero. Uh, zero, okay, so let's cross that one out. Okay, uh, next. The World Health Organization, you keep hearing about uh, Tedros Adhanom, and you're seeing a lot of uh, uh, friendliness with him and China. And uh, he's sat down with uh, Xi uh, Jinping. You've seen this before. It's not, not the first person that's bringing this up. How much of World Health Organization is being controlled by the influence of China on what to report, what not to report, slow roll, you know, the dates at first. It's not that big of a big deal. You know, it's okay. And then U.S. shuts it down and, oh, my gosh, U.S. is racist and they don't care about Chinese people. How could you do something like this? And then they said, no, it's a serious pandemic. The timing was very off and the world relies on this World Health Organization. Uh, our, our World Health Organization, Ted Rose, and China in bed together. Oh, they, they certainly appear to be that way, Patrick. Okay. Um, you got to look at what the WHO did uh, in this circumstance, and it is, there's no adjective in the English language which um, describes how bad Tedros and the WHO were. So, for instance, I talked about that January 14th tweet where the WHO's propagated, helped China propagate the notion that there are no human-to-human -human transmissions of coronavirus where WHO, I'm sure, knew that there were. How could they not know about it? I mean, they're a World Health Organization. They've got doctors. Also, on January 10th, WHO came out with a statement to support China's um, goal of not having countries impose travel restrictions on arrivals from China. So you put those two things together, and it shows that the WHO was very much supporting Beijing's initiatives, and Beijing's initiatives had to be malicious. Also, you know, Tedros did a number of other things. So for instance, in January, he delayed for as long as possible 
WHO's formal designation of the coronavirus as a public health emergency of international concern. Also, he delayed for as long as possible the WHO's designation of coronavirus as a pandemic, which eventually occurred, I think, on March 11th. We saw Tedros um, in um, um, Beijing at the end of January talk about how other countries should emulate China's um, system and talked about the quote unquote superiority of China's system, which is a thinly veiled, veiled attack on democracy. Um, and then of course, WHO has very much been um, supporting the notion that China's statistics are accurate. None of those would be, I think, actions of an organization that really was dedicated to stopping the uh, virus from infecting people. So you put that together. Um, the one thing you can say is that if you took the Communist Party of China and the World Health Organization, um, together they're responsible for this taking this, which should have just been a local outbreak in Wuhan or maybe even Hubei province, and making it, first of all, a nationwide epidemic in China, plus also a global pandemic. None of those last two things would have occurred had not these two organizations, Communist Party and WHO, acted together. So you can, you can argue about who's more responsible, and I think, of course, it's the Communist Party. But the point is, WHO helped spread this coronavirus around the world. And so that its actions on balance have um, been maligned. And that leads us to a number of conclusions about what we do. You talked about the funding of WHO. It's right, the US by far is the largest funder. We put $440 million in the WHO last year. You add Bill Gates, that's a lot of other money. Um, we shouldn't be doing that. Why, why would, what's the, everything to me is about motive. Right. Everything is motive. We get married. Why do you get married? There's a motive. Why do you ask a girl out? Well, there's a motive. Why does she say yes? Motive. Why do you buy a real estate motive? Why do you buy a car motive? Why do you wear clothes motive? Why, why do we do anything? There's a motive behind it. It doesn't mean all the motive is negative. It just means there's motive behind it. Some negative, right. some positive. Okay. What is the motive between World Health Organization protecting China? That's what I'm curious about. You know, I don't know, I, I don't know Tedra, so I'm not in his head. Um, so I can't tell you what his motive is, but you know, you can say that China lobbied very hard for his election as director general of WHO. He has very leftist tendencies. Maybe there's an answer in there. You know, it's a question. I understand why you're looking at motive, um, but you know, motive is one thing that, you know, is really hard to ascertain with certainty. Because as I said, I don't know, in fact, what Xi Jinping was thinking. I don't know, in fact, what Tedros is thinking, but I don't really need to know. All I can see is what they did. And um, that's really where we can see the, the crimes of, uh, that they've committed. So I, I, I don't know motive, but as I said, I don't care. Yeah, only reason I ask is because if somebody's working closely with Tedros, and let's just say they're in a meeting and there are 40, 50 of them and they're on the inside and they know the decisions that were made. There's no way in the world uh, Tedros is the only one that's making a decision. I, I trust there's another 20, 30, 40 people that are in the know of why the decisions were made. Somebody in that group has to be furious because someone in their life, they lost somebody or it affected somebody or they were affected because they're elderly parents were re relying on a retirement plan. Now they have to work harder or one of their relatives lost a bit. Someone has to be furious on the inside with Tedros to be able to come out and say, listen, I don't think you're doing a good job. Just like this 37 year old doctor out of, uh, uh, you know, Wuhan who came out and was a whistleblower to uh, China and said, this is not, we're not doing the right thing. He ended up passing away. He disappeared. I don't know right. what you call that, but I, I, the only reason I'm asking motive is because I do believe Everybody at some level has a certain level of decency to say, I just don't think we're doing the right thing, man. We got to do something about this. And well, you know, uh, especially Bruce, at this magnitude, this is not a small thing here. This is a very big thing here. Someone has to come out and say what really happened. Well, you know, Bruce Alwine, Alward, who has, you know, generally been described as the number two in WHO, his formal title is senior advisor to the director general. 
a couple of days ago, he came out with an interview where he said, you know, it was very important for us at an early stage of the outbreak to be able to study this. So we needed China's cooperation, which is really what his message was. So I suppose you could say that for some people, the WHO, they were saying, well, we got to be nice to China to butter them up so they'll allow us to go to um, Wuhan and study it. But, you know, as we just talked about, WHO, they stiffed armed um, WHO in, in Wuhan. So whatever the motive was, and, and that's really- well, what do you, mean? you just said WHO stiff harm WHO- in no, 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 China stiffed armed WHO, oh, okay. Okay. preventing them from uh, an adequate uh, opportunity to study the, for the virus. I suppose, you know, one could say that maybe that was what they were thinking, but you know, it's very, very difficult to discern motive. What we have to do is, is look at what they did and what they should have known at the time that they committed certain acts. And that leads to very dark conclusions about uh, not only China, but about the WHO. One of the most annoying things that my dad did to me is hold me accountable. I hated it. I couldn't stand it. When I was in the army, I couldn't stand being held accountable to formation and you got to get in and four o'clock and you got to run and you got to report. Accountability is very annoying. But accountability also builds leaders and accountability builds trust. One of the things that seems very common here that's missing is accountability. It concerns me when I even brought it up to you earlier. I said, how should China be held accountable at the, you know, uh, uh, world uh, uh, tribunal? And you're like, well, it's not real. We have to figure out a way to get past this. I, and you said we need to maybe go back to, what you know, Nuremberg and Japan and, you know, Germany, all that stuff. But if there is no accountability, why wouldn't I do it again? If there's right. no consequences, why wouldn't I? It's like, it's a slap in the hand. It's like, hey, okay, I right, no problem. You're okay if I do this again. I'm gonna do it again and again and again because you need me. So where does accountability come into play here? Yeah, well, you know, that's absolutely right. And that's why I said we need to ha impose some costs because if we don't do that, they'll do this again. You know, and I, I suppose the one thing that will happen, um, and this is something that is within our power to do is that countries are going to start isolating China. You know, for, for decades, for five decades, countries have tried to integrate China into the international system. They thought it was a positive good. Um, and because of that, they overlooked a lot of irresponsible and dangerous conduct on the part of Beijing because they wanted to encourage, to entice China so that it would enmesh itself in the you know, rules, norms, conventions, treaties. But you know, it hasn't worked. And what we're seeing is, I think, people starting to understand that China is not reformable. And if China's not reformable, that leads to the conclusion that we need to get China out of the UN, out of the World Trade Organization, out of the World Health Organization, um, and just start to isolate it. And I know people don't want to do that, but you got to remember, you know, we always think, you know, China should be moving on the right path. If you look at what China did, in the SARS epidemic of 2002, 2003, it was really awful. But as awful as it was, its behavior in the coronavirus epidemic of 2019 to you know, 2020, is, it's been much, much worse than it was. And so we've got to understand that uh, our idea of engaging China just has not worked. And we gotta try something else. And I'm not saying, I can't hold my hand over my heart and saying that isolating China will be any better. I think it will, and that's a long conversation in and of itself. But we have to say that what we have been doing has not worked. It's encouraged China to be more belligerent, more provocative, more hostile, more dangerous. So we've got to do something else. I agree. And it has to be uh, uh, some strong measures. It can't be light. You know, it has to be some real measures for them to know you can't keep doing this. Okay. So, so the next one here for you, this, this one's going to be probably a five-second answer for you, and we'll move on with this one. But some people wanted me to ask, so I'm asking this for you. And is this, does this have anything to do with so many powerful people that were linked to Epstein and Clinton and, and what happened there to the point where it's a full-on distraction and it has something to do with China, or you give it zero credibility? Zero. Okay, let's move on. I told you it's going to be five seconds. Next, uh, how much of this has to do with China realizing, because I think they've even said it, uh, one of their military leaders uh, has said that we cannot go against U.S. when it comes down to power of military. They'll crush us. We, we don't have that kind of a 
military that U.S. has, there's no way in the world we can compete with them. So they took a bigger part of their resources to want to invest not in traditional warfare, but more in biochemical, drug trafficking, poisoning, environmental destruction, and computer virus dissemination. How much credibility do you give to that? 100%. 100%. We, we, all we have to do is listen to what Chinese leaders have, have said themselves. Um, Chinese uh, military officers have talked about this. Uh, you know, and we have seen what, what China has done. So um, I, I think that essentially we've got to be really concerned about what you know, they, they call three warfares or unrestricted warfare, which is the title of that book from two colonels who are now two generals. So um, yeah, they, they have been trying to undermine our society. And we don't, we don't really have to, you know, we can see what they've been doing, but we don't really have to speculate too much because last May, uh, May 2019, People's Daily, which is the most authoritative publication in China, it's the self-described mouthpiece of the Communist Party. People's Daily carried a piece um, that declared a quote-unquote people's war on the United States. And Xinhua News Agency also carried that piece. Xinhua is official Chinese government media outlet. So, you know, they declared a people's war. I mean, how clear do we want them to be? You know, we say that they're not transparent, but as, you know, people have said, they telegraph their punches, and that's exactly what they did in this time. You know, we live in a democracy. We may not like our congressman, our senator, our governor, or our president, but we know that they're legitimate because they were elected. In China, uh, and so we don't have propaganda, uh, but in China, when you have an insecure, small ruling group, propaganda is the most important thing. And so they can come up and say these ludicrous things. And, and we Americans are really good at ignoring it by saying, oh, they can't really believe that. But yeah, they really believe it. And they, they uh, propagate these narratives because they believe it's absolutely critical to the survival of the regime. You know, we Americans ignored everything that Osama bin Laden said and did in the 1990s. We should not be ignoring what uh, those who are hostile to us are saying. And so we should be paying attention to what the Chinese have been saying. And it is really belligerent. Why, okay, so I'll follow up with a question on that. I'll go to the next one here. Why, why, it, why does it feel like, um, whether it's the media, whether it's uh, many of these politicians, or even some of the folks who are billionaires from New York or elsewhere, why does it seem like there is a underlying level of, discomfort with putting too much blame on China and uh, holding them accountable and almost protecting them saying, that's not nice. You don't talk to them like that. These are good people. Why would you do that? Why is there such a movement going on? And it's very subtle. You almost can't catch it if you don't pay attention to it that way. Why is that going on? Why do you think? Well, here again, we're dealing with other people's intentions, but my guess is a couple things. First of all, we live in a highly partisan atmosphere right now. And so people are, are just using whatever they can to club President Trump. So that's, I think, part of it. Also because you know, there, um, there are elements in American society that have gotten really rich off of China. And so they don't want that to change. So you've got people on Wall Street, you've got um, people in boardrooms, chambers of commerce. Um, they, they, uh, they see much more in common with their fellows in, in China than they do with uh, other Americans. So there's an elitism, which, you know, it, it's, it's typified, of course, at Davos. Um, so um, I think that that's part of it as well. Um, but, you know, it's really dangerous, Patrick, because what we've got right now is we have a common enemy. That enemy means us harm. And that enemy is attacking us. Um, whether we like him or not, We've only got one president until January 20, 2021. And that means that uh, we're going to have to rally behind President Trump. We're going to have to unify um, because we've got to protect ourselves because our republic is at risk. We tend to think of America as powerful. But if you look around America today, we've got Americans dying. We've got an economy at a standstill in many locations. We've got a society that is paralyzed. 
and we have a common enemy, China. So we Americans have got to wise up and realize there's some pretty dangerous folks out there. And if we don't get together, we're going to lose the American experiment. I agree. Question, uh, uh, question for you uh, uh, on the next conspiracy. How much, uh, how much of this is uh, the media sensationalizing, over-sensationalizing the credibility of a coronavirus to hurt the economy and lengthen this process, the longer it hurts the economy, to eventually lead to President Trump not getting reelected? Is there any credibility to that? I don't do domestic politics, um, but you know, the media is the media. Um, they will sensationalize things. Um, and all parts of the media will, of course, tend to do that. I, I think, you know, most members in the media are responsible, but, you know, there is that sort of tendency to say this is brand new or whatever. Um, but this is, uh, we're, we're dealing with something which creates fear. And that is always going to magnify whatever, you know, irresponsible tendencies there are in human beings. So we're, we, we have fear for a real reason. That is that this is a dangerous um, pathogen. And until we understand it, um, I don't get too concerned about overreaction to it. I'm much more concerned about the underreaction. Um, now, we may be able to um, undo some of the measures that we have taken to beat the virus. I mean, and, and people who are much smarter than I am will be able to talk about that. But nonetheless, until we can see a way out of this, we've got to be very concerned because this bug is highly transmissible and it's also lethal. And it's not just what happened in our society. Take a look at Italy, take a look at Spain, take a look at China, take a look at South Korea. All of these societies have gone through crises and we've got to be concerned what might happen next. Um, are we, uh, next one here, are we, uh, uh, potentially at the beginning of a World War III being created? And if not, will the next World War III be looking similar to what we're currently going through, meaning it being a bio-warfare type of a thing that we'll be dealing with? Um, that's very possible. Um, as, as we started out with your first conspiracy theory, um, I don't think this was a bio-weapon. Um, but you know, and, and a lot of people, you go back six weeks ago, you go back maybe last week, and people would say, oh, look, you know, bioweapons, they aren't really practical, you know, why, why have one? Well, what we have seen is this coronavirus, probably not a bioweapon, but what it's done is it has paralyzed societies. And I'm sure that China and um, um, other countries have seen what a biological agent can do. So this wasn't even a weapon in all probability, but look what it did to the United States. We have, um, you know, we have a Nimitz class carrier, the Theodore Roosevelt, now sitting in Guam, taken out of action because some sailors on it have coronavirus. I think the Chinese have re recognized that because they talk about it in their propaganda. You know, we have a biological weapons convention the United States is a party to it. China is a party to it. But unfortunately, there are no inspection uh, regimes in that uh, convention. And we have got to make sure that it does, because right now we have seen the power of a biological weapon, not a biological. I'm not saying coronavirus is a biological weapon, but this is um, what could be the, what the, the world's future bioweapons look like, just a simple virus. If an evil empire is watching this, there's a few of them. One of them is north of South Korea. If some evil empires are watching this, this is leaving a lot of strategies for other countries to want to use this as a potential method in the future. Forget about just being China. This is like, sure. it's, it's almost as if, you know, the, uh, the, the TV show when it first came out, uh, 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 was it not cops? Was it not America's Most Wanted? What was the one that would show how people were committing the crimes? In a way, they were teaching people how to become criminals. Non-criminals were saying, well, that's a pretty good way of going and robbing a bank. Very creative. Oh, CSI. CSI, yeah. So this, this is one of those things that's teaching a lot of people what is potential uh, to go out there and do. Uh, here's another exactly. 
Here's another conspiracy theory. Tell me if this is a conspiracy or it's 100% fact, factual. Does China have a million to three million people at concentration camps in China uh, over there? That is not a conspiracy theory. Um, they are detention facilities in what China calls Xinjiang, um, which is the northwestern part of China. The local inhabitants say it's not China, that it is a separate republic called East Turkestan. But there are detention facilities there. We don't know the exact number of people in those facilities, but the lower estimates are 1 million, and the upper estimates are what you mentioned, 3 million. Um, and these are, um, they fit the definition of concentration camps. And we know that this is part of China's policy to um, eliminate Uyghur culture um, and eliminate Islam from China. So this is horrific. Is anybody doing anything to that or can they be held accountable to that to be audited or not really? They can do whatever they're doing right now. Well, this is a crime against humanity. This is what, uh, as bad as the Third Reich did before it started the mass exterminations. And what China has done, and people we know are dying in those camps because Beijing has been building crematoria. There's been killing associated with this. It just hasn't been the march you into a gas chamber type of killing. Um, but it's, it's extermination of a culture slowly. Um, it, and we know that people are, are being uh, killed. So this, this, this is a crime against humanity. And there's not too much that the international community can do. It's certainly not very much the international community has done, but Secretary of State Pompeo, to his great credit, has talked about this. And at some point, you know, it, this is one of those things where by itself, it's not gonna get the international community to move, but when in conjunction with, um, you know, the, 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 the initiatives against the Tibetans, which are similar, you know, the attacks on, Christian churches, um, you know, all, all these things that are occurring together, including releasing this virus on the world. These are the types of things when taken in the aggregate are going to get the international community to do something, to start containing China, to start not enriching it with trade and with the rest of it. So I think that we will gradually, I hope sooner, but I think that we will gradually see a new attitude on China, which is going to be we're going to get to the place where we were with the Soviet Union. And it took a long time. You know, George Kennan had to write his long telegram of 1946 and his X article in, 40, in Foreign Affairs in 1947. It took a little bit of time for the United States to get to the point where we saw the Soviet Union as an adversary. Um, I think we're getting there to China about, on China really fast. It's actually not a bad thing. The fact that, that that's happening with the majority, I, I think that's a good, uh, uh, a healthy level of paranoia is a very good thing for a nation. Like you said, I'm not much concerned about overreaction. I'm more concerned about underreaction, which is a powerful statement you made earlier today. So, okay. So look, I got a different question for you now. We're done with the conspiracies. We can go just to some questions for you. You're from China. You lived there two decades. Your father's Chinese. Why do you not like the country your father is from? What do you have against China? I mean, you are, you are half Chinese. What do you have against the country that you know, your family's from. Yeah, I have nothing against China. I, I love China. I have a lot against the, uh, the men and women who rule it as the Communist Party. So this is something where um, it's very different. Um, you know, we talk about China and that's a sort of shorthand, um, but the Communist Party isn't China. And the Chinese people are, first of all, the most direct victims of the Communist Party and because they are, it means that they're one of our most important allies because, you know, the Communist Party is reaching out and causing harm, not just to the Chinese people, but to us as well. And, you know, if you go back before the coronavirus epidemic, um, we Americans sort of looked at what was going on in, in the camps that you mentioned it with the Uyghurs. Um, we looked at the Tibetans, the Christians, people in Hong Kong, people in Taiwan, and we said, oh, that's over there. But right now, we have seen through uh, the deliberate actions of the Communist Party that they have reached out and um, hurt Americans, killed Americans. And so this is no longer just them over there. This is them in our society. You know, just to kind of give us a perspective, when you lived there for two decades, what was the timeline? What years were you there? Okay, I lived in Hong Kong from 1981 to 1991. 
Um, between 91 and 96, um, lived in California, but most of my law practice was in uh, China. So we crossed the Pacific an awful lot. And then from 96 to 2001, lived in, in Shanghai. Um, so, uh, and then after that, I gave up practice of law. This was, uh, my practice was, was focused on, on Hong Kong, China, and the region. But you, you actually said some, you said the fall of China is coming and you predicted it back in 01. I mean, that was, uh, uh, I do believe you said something about China in 2001, right. Right? It was your first prediction you made. Right. And I wrote a book called The Coming Collapse of China, was published July 2001. And in it, I said that the Communist Party would fall by in a, in a decade. So um, I was wrong on timing. Um, I didn't happen to I didn't happen to foresee the 2008 downturn, which I think um, certainly um, materially strengthened the Communist Party for a number of reasons. But I think that it is still coming. And, you know, it's not about me. Um, it's about what we can see on the ground in China, that there is a fragility to the regime. And, um, you know, I can't, I can't say when it's going to occur, but um, we've got to be concerned about a weak China, which I think is much more of concern than a, than a strong China. When, for, for somebody who's never been to China, who's never lived in China, there's a difference if you've gone there for a business trip for a week or two weeks versus living there from 81 to 91 and then from 96 to 01. You've lived there. You have a day-to-day -day life. You're working there. Can you give us a glimpse of what the day-to-day -day life of living in China looks like? Like the biggest difference between U.S. and China. You come home, you watch sports, you watch TV. How many TV channels do you have? How much are you being brainwashed? How are you being brainwashed? What do you have access to from China? What kind of channels? If I'm at a hotel in China, do I have access to ESPN? Can I watch what, what, is, what does it look like? What is, a, what is it like living there compared to U.S.? Well, when, when we lived there, um, there really was, I mean, of course it was different. The U.S. was more prosperous, more developed. Um, but China was, was going through sort of like a renaissance um, when we lived there. There was a lot of optimism. Um, I can remember when we first moved there. It was August 1996. And I, my wife was said, she's on the phone. She said, Mom. China's not communist anymore. And I happen to agree with her. Um, and one could make the case then that a lot of people did, that China was moving in the right direction. And yeah, the, China was just different. I mean, they had better food, but you know, pretty much <laughs> it, was, it, it was, it was, you could see the optimism in society as you could see in America. These days, it's, I think it's different. I mean, China has become much more prosperous, so it is more developed, but it's, it's a debtor place um, because Xi Jinping believes in um, absolute control over society. So um, we are seeing things like uh, the social credit system, which is going to be nationwide pretty soon. We can see extraordinary attempts to control people. So it's a, it's a very different place. And there's, I think, the, the optimism that uh, was there two decades ago is, is not there now. Uh, and part of it that it is going to be very different is that the Chinese economy uh, was not doing well before the coronavirus, but was brought to a standstill and indeed is deep in contraction. Um, so that is a new factor there. And so it makes China, I think, very different from the U.S. This is a very uh, technical question, but probably the most important question I ask you in the interview has your experience with China uh, totally uh, gotten you to a point where you no longer eat Chinese food? No, I eat Chinese food all the time. <laughs> um, you know, Chinese food is great. Um, I love it. As Chinese. I said, China, China has better food than the U.S. does. Yeah, I um, love Chinese food. Okay, so, okay, so uh, social media question for you. I'm, I'm just curious with this one here. If Facebook, if YouTube, if Twitter... If all of these apps that we use in U.S. were available in China the last 10 years, if all of these social media apps were available to the public in China the last 10 years, do you think the pandemic and coronavirus would have gone to the point that it is today? Well, if they were uncensored, like they are uncensored, in the U.S. Uncensored, fully uncensored. Yeah. 
I, I think I think that uh, the Communist Party would have acted very differently because they would not have been able to hide um, things like they did. I mean, there. One of the things that Xi Jinping has done in the coronavirus uh, epidemic is to impose extraordinary information controls. Now, they did that, of course, when the um, virus broke out, but they also, they had a brief period of like three or four days of relative openness from January 20 to January 26, and then they went back to controlling the narrative again. Um, and we know that because um, the Communist Party appointed its leading group on the coronavirus. Uh, under Xi Jinping, basically what's happened is he sort of bypassed the bureaucracy and the Communist Party has set up these groups on the economy or whatever. Well, they set up one on the coronavirus and they announced the roster on January 26. And it was a nine person group. Uh, of the group, there was only one person who was a public health official. And even she, I think her, her degree was not in public health. Uh, though I'm not positive about that. But we do know that it was heavy with um, propaganda officials. The vice chairman was the Communist Party's uh, chief of propaganda. The chairman of the leading group was uh, the premier of the country, who's basically a political hack. And there were a lot of propaganda types on it, which showed that Xi Jinping's priority was not ending the epidemic, but was controlling the narrative. And since that time, there has been evidence of this um, extraordinary secrecy campaign. So they've just gone back to the old way of doing things. So, yeah, things would have been a lot different if, if there were Twitter and Facebook and, and there was just an open and free social media. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the case. I, I, I think if U.S. was to negotiate now with them and if China wants to do any kind of trade deals, do you think it'd be a good idea for President Trump to say, you got to have free press and you have to allow every single one of our platforms in your country with no censorship or else we ain't doing business together? Yeah, I mean, that would be a good thing to do, but Xi Jinping would never agree to that because he, he does believe, he, he believes that he should have absolute control over the party, that the party should have absolute control over society. So he's never going to agree to that. Um, you know, we've got a phase one trade deal signed January 15th. I mean, who knows whether China is going to adhere to its obligations, but phase two is just not going to happen, largely because it is, they, they kick the hard issues um, down the road and um, Xi Jinping is just not going to give up on them. And the issues that, that they've kicked down the road, like state subsidies, are a lot easier for him to deal with than what you just talked about, which is uh, open and free media. That is just completely antithetical to Xi Jinping's conception of the Communist Party. I'm from Iran. I'm born in 1978. I was born in Tehran at the peak of the revolution when it was taking place with Sinema Rex's fire, where three months after I was born, the Shah was in exile. And it was the largest coup you ever saw. Nine million people revolted against the Shah. And a lot of uh, things that you're you know, seeing, you're talking about the, nothing was happening to this extreme. I mean, extreme in Iran at all. The economy was doing better. Women were free. They could go out there and, you know, uh, uh, vote. They had freedom. They could do pretty much every career. They didn't have to get married, you know, 13 years old. He had raised it to 18 years old. And then Khomeini comes in and through a revolution of spreading tapes, the people revolted against the regime until it eventually flipped. Wasn't the best thing for them. That's why I got this guy's picture in the back. Obviously, there's a reason why the Shah's in my painting in the back. What are the chances of the people of China getting so sick of it where they create their own coup and go against the regime? And if they do, how likely is it that they'll be successful? Well, you know, the, the, they, did, they, were, they tried that in 1989, um, in a sense. They didn't actually, in 1989, the um, genesis of this was basically unhappiness about the economy, which then was booming, but there was a lot of inflation. But what happened is through Communist Party hardheadedness, um, people then started talking about the big issues, about democracy, about freedoms. And that's when, you know, we saw not only in Beijing, but in 370 other cities in China, um, people took to the streets. Um, right now, we are seeing some really interesting uh, trends and developments. So, for instance, you were talking about the death of Dr. Li Wenlong, who was one of the Wuhan eight. When he died, there was white-hot sentiment throughout social media in China. People were 
you know, they started that hashtag, I want freedom of speech. And also they started to adopt as their anthem that uh, politically impactful song from Les Miserables, Do You Hear the People Sing? And um, that was a clear message to Xi Jinping, especially because the kids in Hong Kong had adopted that um, as a protest against China. So it was unmistakable what people in China were saying. Now, there have been a lot of times where um, people in, in China had gotten really upset at the Communist Party, and that anger for one way or another had melted away. But the, what's different now, Patrick, is that you've got an economy which is basically um, collapsed. If there were to be... Timing. Isn't it perfect timing, though, when, what you're saying right now? When the economy yeah, the collapses, it's the best time to do it. It's, it's a time where I think people um, are not going to buy the argument that the Communist Party is the one to ensure prosperity because there's no prosperity. You have, you know, you can see what's happening in our country. Um, the same thing has happened in China only earlier. But, you know, you've had an economy which is probably for the first quarter of this year down 25 percent, maybe 30 percent year on year, um, which is an enormous number. Um, they won't report that, of course, um, but um, you, you've, you people's livelihoods are at stake. You know, so many small businesses in China have closed, like they've closed in our country. So this is sort of like the uh, the tinder for um, an explosion. Whether it happens or not, I can't say uh, at this time, but people in China have been talking about, quote unquote, China's Chernobyl. And, and that, of course, is the reference to the nuclear plant accident in 1986 in the Ukraine, which is generally thought to be the event that sort of triggered a long, slow burn to the fall of the Communist Party. Uh, here's a question for you. How, how much of exposure or presence do we have with the CIA in, in uh, China right now? Do we have a big presence there or not really? I don't know, but I think the answer to your question is not really. About 18 months ago or so, China executed somewhere between 20 and 30 CIA agents. I mean, first of all, you, you had a number of presidents um, before Trump who just put China very low in the priority. So the CIA just didn't have that much in the way of resources in China to begin with. And then China goes in and just kills, literally kills a, dozens of them. And so I don't think they've had is a chance to by rebuild. The way? Is, is that verified of killing dozens? It's been widely reported in you know, Wall Street Journal and the rest of it. So How, how did we retaliate towards that? Um, no known retaliation. Why? Don't ask me. I mean, if, if I were president, um, there would have certainly <laughs> been, I, I... there certainly would have been costs imposed on China for doing that. But, you know, China's occupied a special place in the American foreign policy establishment, which is the reason why we're in such trouble as we are. Um, but, you know, I don't think the CIA, to answer your question, I don't think the CIA has had the opportunity to rebuild in China. And you got to remember that China's been tossing out um, Western journalists who aren't CIA, but that also reduces our ability to look into the country. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, you know, our visibility into China right now is is not very good, which should lead us to believe that if we can't understand what's going there, then why should we have you know robust relations with them? Here's where I was going with this. If we have the right CIA agents there, by the way, we, we need to really invest in a major, 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 uh, uh, I would be recruiting agents left and right to send them there and i would do it in the most strategic way and start them early and have them go through the educational system etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean you have to be doing that right in a way to protect yourself long term and i would do it in a way to get them involved in the executive side to have a lot of involvement there but that's a complete different side long term wise uh, uh here's the question i'm asking about the cia technology is more advanced today than it's ever been before right if if these folks say the millennials the gen x's because that's really the best foot soldiers you're going to have to update us on what's going on just like today if you do something nowadays it's the millennials and the gen xers and the founder generation they're the ones that are telling us what's going on with the camera being on and you know TikTok and videos everything right if if technology is as advanced as it is and we have some presence there with cia how hard would it be for us to bring a 
open VPN line and spread that amongst everybody there to have Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. I mean, we have some of the most brilliant minds in the world. You mean to tell me we cannot get internet there and fight it so quickly? So if they're doing what they're doing, we're going to put millions of cameras to work by having this younger generation who will revolt. You know, the older folks will not revolt because they have more to lose. The younger generation, they've always been the ones that have been able to create the revolution, whether it was in Iran where there was any kind of a movement you look at, it's always the younger generation that's willing, even if you look at Ron Paul or Bernie Sanders, their biggest momentum creators were who? Younger generation. Right. So if we can get technology there with the right VPN, whatever measures it takes to start kind of seeing what's going on, I think that's going to piss them off. The government's going to piss them off. Then it's going to get the people who are skeptical whether the government's doing the right thing or not of China then maybe that leads to the people saying, we're just sick and tired of it. we got to make a change here. And uh, yeah, I, that's the only way I feel safe for long term of doing business with uh, uh, China. That's the only way I would feel safer. Yes. And, and there are NGOs that have um, talked about developing the means, the technical means of jumping over what's called the Great Firewall. And so there, there is some effort there. Could use a lot more push from the federal government. You know, there's something else that can be done, and that is shortwave radio, which is what we used against the Soviet Union. Uh, China can, can, because it's got the Great Firewall, can block the Internet, but they can't block shortwave radio um, as a practical matter. So there's a number of things that we need to do to be able to get through to the Chinese people, because ultimately the Chinese people are our greatest ally because we've got a common interest. We've got one group that is oppressing them and causing death in our country. And that's the Communist Party of China. So we should be looking to our friends, the Chinese people. Look, when we lived in Iran, we had two channels, right? And the rich people had uh, uh, satellites and you would always, oh my gosh, you have satellite and look at this, you can go watch movies and there's kissing and there's this. It was like, oh, my rich people can watch crazy movies, you know, poor people cannot, you know. and. Uh, you go to your friend's house who had satellites and they lived in this city called Gandhi. There was a city in Iran called Gandhi, which is pretty interesting. That was a rich people's city. And we had a friend that lived there. We'd go there and say, look at us, we have a satellite. Shh, don't tell anybody because we could get in trouble. I, I, think, I think that's, you know, I think that's what China needs. Whatever we did with China, whatever we did with Russia, uh, I think the people need that because we need to get more documentation of what's going on. We're getting a glimpse of it right now, but not at the measures that we need. Uh, uh, to to get that back to what it needs to be. So final exercise here with us, but before I go into this final exercise, is there, what do you see with the foreseeable future? How long is this thing going to last? What do you, when do you see us going back to work? And is there any positive outlook you have of how things are going to turn out the next three, six, nine, 12 months? Well, I sort of think the virus does burn out during the summer. Um, you know, as we're talking about, um, it might not. I mean, this is a bug that likes hot weather. So who knows what it's going to do? You know, I, I think that we can see a couple things that are occurring um, in China because they're obviously ahead of us. So, for instance, in Wuhan, where this thing started, that's sort of the bug has burned itself out. And so Wuhan is just slowly getting back to normal. And, you know, they just opened up um, the barricades so people in Wuhan can actually travel. Um, to other parts of China, if they've got a green code, you know, they get green, yellow, red, depending on their health. So if they got a green code, they can, they can actually leave. Um, so it's sort of getting there. But the problem for China right now is that the bug has, I think, jumped to cities on the east. Um, so for instance, in Shanghai, um, at the end of last month, they started closing down tourist venues that had just been opened a few days before. So there's a real indication that um, they have got a problem there. Um, and you can sort of see it in their statistics, which they're issuing on daily infections. They seem that daily infections, both, uh, all of them, asymptomatic and, and symptomatic are going up. So I think that there's a second wave that's hitting. The second and, and third wave have been hitting peripheral areas to China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, South Korea. So it's probably going to hit China as well. It's probably well developed there. So China is sort of where the rest of the world is going, which means for us, it, you know, New York, the bug will burn itself out. 
um, and coronavirus will jump to other cities like it's doing. So um, it'll burn itself out in those other places as well. You know, I think that maybe by the middle of June we'll be through this, but um, God help us next fall. That, that, that was your attempt at giving a motivational speech, which maybe you need to listen to a little bit more Tony Robbins to pick up some uh, uh, abilities on how he does it. I don't know. Maybe you need to kind of uh, work on that. So by the way, just something for you to be thinking. Don't let your wife discourage you from uh, thinking about the comedy side because let the jokes come out. Don't, don't let okay. her convince you not to let the jokes come out. Okay. Last part here. I'll give you some names and give me the first word that you think about. Whatever word that you think about, give me the first word. We call this a speed round. Bill Gates. Oh, too much money. Elon Musk. Um, too much idiocy. Idiocy? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, the early Elon Musk, you know, great man, going into space, Tesla, I think that's terrific. The, the problem, though, is that I think fame has gone to his head. And, you know, it was typified what we saw two, three months ago with that dance he did in, in China. I mean, that just shows you that I think he's gone too far. Um, I, I don't think he's going to make money in China with electric cars um, for a number of reasons. I think that this could be where he really gets a real lesson. You know, it's like sort of fame's gone to his head. So, 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 so you were really frustrated with his dance moves. So yeah. if, he, if he improved his dance moves, would you not call him an idiot? So, or, or would you change well, your opinion? Well, no, he, it's, it's, still, it's still going to his head. Okay, got it. Maybe we need to recommend some nice uh, uh, choreographers to hire. He can afford it. So uh, Tedros uh, Ad, Ad, uh, Hanem. Yeah, I, I think that uh, he needs to resign. If he doesn't resign, we need to defund the WHO. Um, what he did was despicable. So... Um, I don't have a good word to say about him. And I, have, I, I sometimes am not able to think of, I, I don't think they're, you know, he leaves me speechless. So is it fair to say you don't have a picture uh, on that bookshelf of yours behind you? Of Tedros? Yeah, no. you're not going to have nope. it. Okay. Pretty it's, it's my daughter, my wife, my in-laws, a couple of me, you know, friend from college. No Tedros. No Tedros. Well, it is what it is. Margaret Chan. Ineffective. Ineffective. Xi Jinping. Criminal. Anthony Monster. Fauci. Anthony Monster. Fauci. Anthony Fauci. A hero. Hero. Moon Jae In. Um, another criminal. Moon Jae In wants to, he, he wants South Korea to be merged into North Korea and probably on North Korea's terms. So he wants to end democracy in South Korea. Um, I mean, he, uh, Moon Jae-in is one of my favorite topics, actually. Um, so it's hard to come up with just one word for him. Um, but uh, I think that he's dangerous. He's no friend to the US. Um, he would love to be a totalitarian. He is moving China and moving South Korea away from uh, a liberal democracy back to an authoritarian state. So. What nice things can you say about him? Ren Zheng Fi. Um, liar. I mean, he keeps on saying, oh, you know, um, Huawei would never spy for the uh, Communist Party. Well, I got news for you. The 2017 National Intelligence Law of China requires every Chinese national, every Chinese entity to spy if demanded. And besides, in the Communist Party's top-down system, you can't resist a demand from the Communist Party. Ren himself is a member of the party. Um, so, you know, I put him into the basket of dangerous individuals. Last but not least, Li Wenliang. Hero. hero. Clear, clearly hero. And he sacrificed his life to try, you know, he, he went to the, you know, he went to everyone talking about the disease. He did that at great personal risk to himself. Eventually, as a doctor, he lost his life treating coronavirus patients. I mean, it just sort of brings tears to your eye. Well, uh, sir, this has been a uh, very, very insightful, and hopefully the viewers were able to look at some of these different conspiracies that's being tossed around and getting millions of views and getting people's attention. And quite frankly, it's putting a lot of fear in people. I got a call the other day at 1130 at night, 
One of my friends who's a very successful businessman called me and him and his wife. We're on the phone. I had to have an hour and a half conversation with this person because they were buying into some of these conspiracy theories that really were messing with their heads. And uh, it's not just getting naive people. It's getting everybody to start kind of questioning some of this stuff because uh, the way it's being sold, it's very convincing. So again, uh, at the end, here's what I suggest to all the viewers. We're going to put the link below of uh, following Gordon G. Chang Twitter handle. You can send him a tweet after watching this. Let him know what you took away from the interview as well as any questions you may have. And we're going to put the link of your book, Coming Collapse of China, the link below as well for you guys to purchase. Any final thoughts before we wrap up the interview? You know, our, our society, let me, let me just repeat something that I said that um, we're really at risk. We are going to have to band together um, because, you know, as Ronald Reagan said, you know, freedom is only one generation away from extinction. Well, now it could be a couple of years away from extinction. So we've really got to get together um, and as Americans defend our society and our way of life. Gordon, thank you for being a guest. Thank you so much, Patrick. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. So look, with all these conspiracy theories, you kept asking me, Pat, do you believe this stuff? Now it's on you to process it for yourself. This man, Gordon Shank, seems like a reasonable person. He doesn't seem like he's sensationalizing either one. You can process it and comment below which one did you believe in, which one of them do you still have your own doubts. And if you like this interview, I have two other videos I want you to watch. One of them was with Danielle DiMartino Booth, economist, nine years with Federal Reserve Dallas, who has a lot of insider info on what's going on with the economy and the Fed. She talks about the aftermath of the economy post-coronavirus, must watch. And the, the other one is if you haven't watched it with General Spaulding from Air Force, who had some inside dealing with China. He lived there to find out what their world is like. If you haven't watched this one, it's a must watch as well. Click on either. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.